Hi, everybody. Welcome to the eSports Trends and Social Good panel. I hope you're feeling good. I know this is sort of later in the day, and it's the second day of the, the, the festival, so it's a little bit of the after-lunch slump of the festival, if you will. So take my energy if you need it. And uh, <laughs> Nathan here is actually going to tap dance for us in about a half an hour as he has to leave at 5 o'clock. Uh, so it'll be entertaining. So to give you an idea of what, what this is going to look like, uh, we have about 45 minutes uh, and a lot of things to say between the four of us. So we're going to try to keep it to two or three minutes per answer per person so everyone gets to give their two cents. And we'll start off by introductions. So panelists, if you can please introduce yourself with your name, what you do, and one reason that you are passionate about esports, and we'll start with Ben at the end. Thank you. Uh, how's it going? My name is Ben Nickel. I'm the head of events and business development at uh, New York Excelsior, and, and I guess I can now say Anbox, the, the, the parent company that sits, a, sits atop NYXL. NYXL is the uh, first professional esports team to be regionally based here in New York City. Uh, and the thing that I'm most passionate about is community development. I'm very excited to build this thing from, from the ground up uh, instead of from the top down. Greetings, everyone. I'm Gerald Solomon. I'm the executive director of the Samueli Foundation. And to some degree, I'm kind of the newbie here. Up until eight months ago, I knew nothing about esports. I run a family foundation, been doing it for 11 years, and we're really about um, social justice and giving disenfranchised individuals and people of color opportunities in life that without some help, they wouldn't be able to attain. And when I took my first look at esports at UCI, which is you know, quite a program around esports, I go, man, this is like the golden child. This is the Trojan horse. How do we hook in kids in a way that they can connect their play and their passion with some purpose? And I'm here to talk a little bit about that. Hi, everybody. Uh, Nathan Lindbergh, unofficially Chief Pants Officer at Twitch, <laughs> uh, officially uh, Senior Director on Global Partnerships. Uh, I've worked at Twitch for about four years now. Twitch is a live streaming service that you're not watching on right now, but you should. Uh, and uh, we were acquired by Amazon in 2013. Um, and I am most passionate about helping brands uh, kind of get into the space and help to create social good through the stuff that they're doing mm -hmm. uh, on the brand side. Great. Hi, everybody. My name is Maya Kushner. I am an attorney working in DC, but I'm also the COO of Game Gym. We are a youth esports school in Maryland where we teach esports as traditional sports. So not only the tactics of the games, but also the importance of nutrition and sleep and everything else that makes a great athlete. And the reason I'm passionate about esports is because I see games as combining like fun and good all in one because obviously games are super fun and that's what we do to connect and to, to interact, to entertain ourselves. But they're the ultimate good because they're the ultimate equalizer, right? They transcend boundaries. Um, men and women can play together. Children and adults can play together. Um, people with difficult, different uh, physical attributes can play together. So for example, I can't play basketball with Michael Jordan, but I can play NBA 2K with him and have an even matchup. So that's what I'm passionate about. So as we're sitting actually in the green room, uh, this isn't a question that we we're originally going to talk about, but someone asked us, well, what is eSports? And I realized we probably should start with that, that there's a difference between gaming and eSports. So what is gaming to you? How do you define, excuse me, how, what is eSports to you? How do you define it? And how is it different or essentially a sector of gaming? Oh boy. Uh, I think my answer is probably going to be the one that uh, you guys most disagree with because I think it's very <laughs> simple. I think eSports is people playing games together. Um, anytime you bring us together to sit in a room and compete or just sit side by side, to me that's an eSports experience. Um, and it's as simple as that. So as a non-gamer, non-esports person here, I'll just say <laughs> ditto. <laughs> but beyond that, I'll go back to where I come from, and that is, it is, and I'll use this term several times, it is the Trojan horse, it's the equalizer that you talk about, where you can give opportunity to people who otherwise are not engaged or don't have opportunity, and I see it as the up-and-coming platform with two colleagues or three colleagues around me here who see the huge potential around societal change and impact that esports can have. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, at Twitch we look at it a little bit more as kind of the combination of play and sports. Mm -hmm. And so gaming and, and eSports are kind of like play and sports. And so I look at it more of the organized aspects of competitive play. Um, certainly there are games like Fortnite and StarCraft where you play competitively. Um, but typically what we look at it and what we justified or call eSports is really that idea of an organized kind of competitive environment. Um, you and your buddies playing you know, in the backyard maybe wouldn't be considered a sport, and therefore I wouldn't necessarily consider it an e-sport. Um, but I think it comes down to kind of semantics at that point. But uh, we typically look at around organized. This is usually the word, that, the, kind of the key word. Makes sense, makes sense. And I, I think my definition uh, would agree with, with uh, Nathan's that e-sports is really the competitive side of gaming. So you can get together and you can play League of Legends casually, but if you're entering even online tournaments or going to LANs, it doesn't have to be anything you know, at, at a super professional level, but you're taking it to the next step where you're actually practicing and competing uh, rather than just sort of playing for fun. Uh, that's where it crosses just from gaming into e-sports. So now that we've defined it, and <laughs> <laughs> this was an interesting question because as you can see, even the people in the industry don't really agree on the definition. So that, that's, that's pretty cool because it's, it's growing, so it's changing. So let's look at the esports industry. It, it is grown leaps and bounds, right? From just a couple people playing video games in their basements or garages to this huge <clears throat> industry that has professional players and cosplayers and casters and online personalities, music makers, all for this one industry. So looking at this huge scope, what is a big trend that you're seeing in the industry? What is something that maybe was a long time coming or is just exploding right now? An example that I think about is big name investors getting into, getting into the game, pun sort of intended. <laughs> for example, uh, NBA star Rick Fox purchasing a professional League of Legends team, right? So big name investors sort of getting in um, into the industry. So what are some big trends that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, the, the trend you're talking about is this idea that the franchising model uh, is going to continue and grow. And, and certainly as, uh, you know, a, a, a leader on an Overwatch organization, it's something that I advocate for and believe in. But I think the one that I want to talk about today is actually education. Uh, and I think it's something that's pretty consistent with the spirit of this whole kind of event. Uh, I think gaming represents such a spectacular opportunity for educators to reach young people in new ways. Gerald was just, was just kind of touching on it. Um, but if I, like, first of all, the biggest barrier to entry for games or esports is very simply access to games. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of kids in New York City that don't have the ability to sit mm -hmm. down and play. Uh, so just by taking games into a classroom, I've fundamentally changed the entire discussion. Now every kid has a chance to sit down and play. Uh, and through that experience, that kid has an opportunity to do so much more than play. Uh, yeah, they can play, but they can, they can set up the games, and they can set up the streams, and they can create their own in-house uh, in tournament, mm -hmm. uh, and they can market that, and they can produce that, and there's, there's, there's like so many skills that you can learn around it. And with all of that also comes mentorship and development. Uh, this idea that there's an entire second half of kids that don't go out for the sports team, that don't have the chance to learn from a great coach or to have a great leader or role model say, nah, it's not cool to be toxic, kid. Don't do that. Don't be toxic, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I think, I think education is, is the biggest and the most important trend that we're looking at right now in gaming. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in so many ways, it's the future uh, hey, guess what? For my business, running a professional Overwatch team, I think the best way I can develop fans is by reaching them at a young age and helping change their lives. So I'm going to be kind of the outcast in some ways as we answer some of these questions. So I think the industry is the best and the worst of social Darwinism. It's the best in that the opportunities are... Um, expansive, they're unbridled, they're really open to creativity and innovation and entrepreneurship, and it's the worst because of that, that it still is yet to be other than what some people refer to it as the wild, wild west. Mm -hmm. um, because of the nature of its evolution and development, it doesn't have yet its own built-in, from our perspective, sets of values 
in sets of codes around performance and personality and the like. And from our perspective as a foundation, we see because of the opportunity that you all bring as an industry, we think that part of our responsibility is how do we make that front and center in the conversation? The education, the social consciousness, um, the social good, et cetera. Yeah, I think a lot of that comes from third child syndrome. I think that if you look at sports in general, the amount of time it's taken for the NCAA to establish their business, the NFL to establish their business, um, people are expecting esports to do that in neck breaking speed. Right, it's like the parent who's like, why aren't you driving yourself to school? And it's like, mom, I'm nine. <laughs> your, your siblings drive to school? Well, mom, they're older than me, right? Like, mm -hmm. there is this expectation that esports will like, all of a sudden fix itself. And I think that's, that's an unrealistic expectation that we have to kind of manage. Um, I think for me, the biggest, uh, the biggest trend right now is the rise of the female uh, in gaming. Um, if you look at just Twitch audience, I joined Twitch four years ago, 7% generous 7% of our audience was female. It's close to 30% at this point. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing you know, more female streamers, more female fans. We're seeing our, our events. We're seeing more people taking uh, an active role. We're seeing uh, players in Overwatch League uh, breaking those barriers, NBA 2K. Um, and they're not really barriers. They're just kind of mental blocks that I think um, you know, female empowerment will become a bigger and bigger issue uh, and a bigger opportunity globally with games. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're, we're finally starting to see females feel um, safe, feel empowered, uh, and feel the opportunity to succeed, and, and that's awesome. Like, eSports, I think, in general, is such an inclusive environment mm -hmm. that we need to practice what we preach from that perspective. Um, and really, we're starting to see that in a big way, and I think it's gonna get even bigger. That's awesome. So we're actually going to talk a little bit later about the inclusion of women in esports, but this is a, this is a great preview of, of, of what we're going to talk about a little bit and a little bit. Um, e, um, industry trend that I'm seeing that is really big actually echoes, echoes off of Ben's point, which is accessibility to games, especially in terms of financial accessibility, right? Not everyone has a gaming computer or can afford to buy a gaming computer, or if you're just starting out, you know, maybe you can afford one, but you don't want to put $2,000 into this whole rig and then realize that esports isn't for you. So creating games that are more easily accessible for beginners and people of different socioeconomic backgrounds is the big trend in the industry right now. And companies are uh, accomplishing it in a couple of different ways. One of them, you can look at some of the games that are most popular right now are free to play. So that's League of Legends, Fortnite. Um, some games have lower, tech specs so you can actually run it on a computer that's not uh, you know, a gaming rig. So for example, I actually started playing League of Legends when I was in law school. And I had a laptop that I just had you know, for taking notes. It didn't have a graphics card, it had integrated graphics. And I could still play League of Legends. Now when Overwatch came out, I couldn't even open it on my computer, right? So companies really coming out with games that more people are able to run on the devices that they have or the new devices that are coming out online, right? So like Google Stadia, where you can essentially stream the game from Google's super-powered <laughs> machines and you know, it comes onto your device and you just play it on whatever device you have. And in the same vein, I see mobile gaming really entering the, the eSports arena. There, there seems to be this divide where like, oh, well, mobile games are for casual players and they're not even, we don't even call them gamers where like the PC players are the serious ones and, and that's what esports is. But as companies try to reach other markets, especially if you're looking at India or South America, a lot of people don't have computers, let alone gaming computers, but everyone has a cell phone. So if we can put games or even esports, competitive games on a cell phone, that's where that's where we're really gonna reach the growth in, in those countries and in some of those areas. And that's already happening. So for example, the, the Riot's uh, Team Fight Tactics, which was released on PBE today, um, is this game mode that Riot said might be available on mobile, which sounds like that's what they created it for. And you know, rightfully so, because that's definitely a big trend. So thank you for those answers. On the flip side, let's think about some of the smaller trends, maybe they actually don't even exist yet. What is something 
that we as professionals foresee happening in the industry? Um, I'm going to pick one that uh, is certainly happening right now and is, has happened for a long time, but I think it's neglected professionally. Uh, and it's, it's, it's community, it's grassroots, it's this idea of uh, a kid's going to throw a tournament at the corner store and 30 people are going to come and play. Mm -hmm. um, I have a strong belief that the foundation of this entire industry is people getting together to play games, right? Esports is people playing games together at its core. It's not about organized. It's not about competitive. It's about people coming together through shared love of gaming to uh, share in this experience together, right? We, yes, you can you can wrap it up and call it competitive. Is it an esports tournament, esports or a gaming tournament? Yeah, certainly, um, but I think games done quick, people getting in a room to play games fast. I think that's esports, mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, there's a million other examples that that we can make of it. But at the core of it is this idea that people are going to come together, be in the same room. Uh, share in this experience and 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 just because they want to they just want to they just want to be around their peers uh, it's social uh, and um, I think as industry professionals we have this terrible tendency to just like look at the top of the pyramid and say how do I you know how do I close that next big sponsorship deal how do I run the next broadcast that has hundreds of thousands of viewers tuning in how do I create the next franchise league and generate more than a billion dollars in revenue Great questions. Um, I don't care. How do I get people in a room to play games together? Because I need that. Those are the people that make it real. Uh, when Overwatch League home games come to New York City next year, we're going to have to fill an arena. And if those people aren't there, then what we're doing, what's it matter? Um, so to me, the, the, the important thing to focus on and the things to not neglect and the thing to not forget about is uh, your community, local, grassroots, get together, play games, watch games, celebrate games. So let me take that a step further, Ben. And it's a question we ask in all the work we do all the time. To what end? Why? For what purpose? And I think that the industry and the people who are involved around gaming and esports are starting to recognize that it's more than just play. They look at other sports, football, baseball, basketball, et cetera, and what's happened over the last, clearly, decade, when you look at the San Francisco Giants, you look at the Red Sox, you look at the Anaheim Ducks, et cetera, they all have defined their sport with some other community purpose and value, whether it's around learning a specific task or function, the science or the technology or the math behind whatever their sport is. There's something that they're imparting besides just the fun of the game, and I think the people who are growing up with and really engaging in esports and gaming are asking those questions that other sports didn't ask. What's the purpose? What's the impact? Why am I doing it? Sure, it's fun and there's community, but there's a deeper overriding potential purpose here. And I think that is a huge opportunity for what esports and gaming has in its future. I think, you know, the, the thing that's, I think, appreciated but not talked about is the fact that uh, gaming is really kind of the first global unification tool, mm -hmm. right? You look at sports, every sport has a different iteration of where you, based on where you're playing it, right? So I've seen soccer matches in the US, in South America, in Asia. There are different rules, there are different subtleties to how things are played, but League of Legends is the same everywhere. It's the exact same everywhere. And when you think of the power of creating common ground with someone and the abilities to play the same exact game together and to have that be a force for good to be able to really relate to somebody who maybe you don't share the same language with, you don't share the same religious beliefs with, you don't share the same economic, uh, socioeconomic values with, like that's a pretty powerful tool to kind of make the world a really small place um, but for a good reason, right? To be able to connect with every single person and for all of those people to have the exact same shared experience, um, I think is really, really powerful and I think it will become a bigger and bigger part of conversation as we go forward is the fact that we can truly bridge not just you know regional divides in the US, we can bridge global divides across the world, across culture, because gaming is gonna be this really unique unification tool um, that is gonna make everybody kind of give them the same language, mm -hmm. which, is, which is that gaming experience.
I actually think you can wrap up all three of those answers and say it's about finding your tribe, finding that, finding your, you know, identity that you share with you know, other people around you. Sorry. Yep. I absolutely agree. My answer is actually going to be extremely different. I, I agree with all of you guys in terms of, uh, you know, that grassroots move, movement and and really bringing people together and, and the social experience of games. Um, but a trend that I foresee in the future is actually more lawsuits. So as an attorney, <laughs> this is something that I think about a I lot. I think you're a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think the the area of uh, of IP law of um, of IP rights is very interesting because, like you said, gaming is global, right? Um, so people are playing League of Legends all over the world, but each country has different IP laws. So as we bring each game to a different country, how how are the IP laws going to interact with each other? With each other, and yes, we're moving furniture now <laughs> up there. Okay. Uh, one of the question, uh, one of the examples I think about is China. Right? China has been notoriously lax with enforcing IP rights, but China is also one of the biggest manufacturers of games at the moment. So, are they going to become? Uh, you know, more strict in enforcing those IP rights because they actually want to retain more of that revenue and those royalties and, and you know, what have you from, from the games. And the other aspects of law that I think is interesting is infringement, right? So if uh, you create a game or you write a book, right, I can't take that book and write an extra chapter and say, that's mine now, I'm going to sell it. That's infringement, right? One of the things that isn't infringement under the law is used for satirical purposes. So if you draw a painting, and I take that painting, and I turn it into a comic, and now it's funny, that I'm not infringing, legally speaking, right? But half of games and esports is memeing, right? It, 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 half of it is satirical. You take something that someone made, and, and you slap a picture of, you know, a photo of a grumpy cat on top of it, and suddenly your thing is even more popular than the original that someone else made. So to me, I'm super curious to see where that's going to go, um, how that is resolved in the courts and where we draw the line um, for, for intellectual property rights uh, as, as gaming grows further. So as I said uh, earlier, we're going to talk a little bit about including women in esports and just so, I guess, if you could turn down your audiobook. I don't know what that is, but um, okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about inclusion. So as I said earlier, and I think a lot of you, all of you agreed, right, that gaming is the ultimate good. It, it has the capability to erase these barriers, and in some ways, it's already extremely inclusive. Um, for example, just the number of countries uh, and, you know, people in all those countries that are playing these same games. But one thing that remains sort of conspicuously absent is, is gender inclusion. So I, I love League of Legends, that's why my, most of my examples are from there. So I follow the professional teams and the North American um, LCS, that's you know, the, the championship um, in League of Legends has 10 teams, that's 102 people. And all of them are men, all of the players are men. So it, when we're looking at companies too, there are very few female employees and even fewer uh, women in leadership roles in those, in those companies. So looking at that, first let's talk a little bit about barriers, right? Because I think when we're looking at problems, it's helpful to define what the problem is first rather than launching <coughs> in to how to solve it. So what is a barrier that you see uh, for entry for women into the esports industry? Oh God, I don't want to answer this question. Because I don't think it's there, you know. I think that what we have is a history and an industry that was built by mostly white men. Um, and I think that a lot of us, white guys, would like to see more women at the table and with more diversity around the table, you know. Uh, at NYXL, a third of our leadership team is female. And uh, half of our staff is female. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's awesome. It's a great dynamic. And um, there's been no barrier to getting those girls through the door. It took them raising their hand and say, I want the opportunity. And then, yes, going through the process and being excellent. Um, you know, I, the, the barriers are probably social and cultural and stigma and hard. And, like, is it more difficult to do anything as a woman than as a white male in today's world? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. um, 
but in my most honest opinion, um, games and esports is a space that really desires inclusivity, uh, and um, I don't think I've seen any industry making the very deliberate strides to be more inclusive than I've seen uh, in gaming and in, in esports, especially here recently. Um, yes, our industry is male dominated. You go to any gaming event, it's going to be 85% dudes, um, unless you come to one in New York, and it's going to be 70% dudes. 30% of our fan base is female. I think that's probably mostly because there's more women in New York than men. Um, well, but there's I more women technically everywhere than men. Right? Fair. We're over 50% of the Absolutely population. Absolutely fair. Uh, you know, but but at the end of the day, I, I can acknowledge yes, it's a problem that we don't have more diversity around the table. Period. But I see it changing, and I see it changing rapidly. Is it changing fast enough? Probably not. Um, but I just want I just want more more girls to come to the table. So, so I think Nathan said it well when people's expectations are immediate. They want to see it now. They want to see what took other sports 10 or 20 or 50 years. They want to see esports do it tomorrow. And it's a partly an issue of maturation, just the maturity of the sport and the whole, uh, what I'll call ecosystem around it. And I'll take that last phrase and I'll build on that and I'll say that it's not just the game Part of what happens is you look at engineers, you look at scientists, you look at chemists, you look at any field. If people don't see themselves and they don't see where they belong, they, have, they struggle and they have trouble feeling a sense of belonging and fitting in. The creation of community, um, the idea of being able to look at gaming beyond just the competitive play part. But when you look at a team, in whatever team you pick, there's a finite number of people who are the professionals within the team. And they're surrounded by an array of often thousands of people who support the professionals. Part of what esports has the potential to do is to shine a light on what that whole ecosystem of gaming is all about. And clearly, people will see, oh, I like logo design, or I like web development, or I like um, business planning, or I like event planning, or I like marketing. And I like esports, and I like gaming. And I can find my space and place within the community that you alluded to. And as a result, there's huge opportunity. So some of it is the maturation issue that you talk about, and some of it is just the exposure and getting the maturity of what esports and gaming is about so people can see themselves within the construct of what it's all about. Yeah, so there's a, there's a number of things. I think uh, the first... The first thing to me is that we, we don't have those leaders yet. Um, you know, I, I think it's always unfair to take the first woman in Overwatch League and force her to somehow carry the mantle of all of womenhood in esports. And, and that's what I think has been unfairly done. You have to wait for the right people who are willing to take up that cause and make it an issue and make it a situation. I think we're going to get there. You have to have the ecosystem for that. What we cannot do is we cannot fall into the trap of separate but equal competition. It's insulting, it's embarrassing, like we know it doesn't work, we know it's a bad idea, and yet I see these you know, all women CSGO tournaments and all women this, like th that's insulting. Like there should be no difference in the competition. If you're a male, if you're a female, if you're somewhere in between, you should be allowed the opportunity to compete at any tournament you want to. It should be about skill, it should be about passion. And I think the industry right now, everybody is so you know, concerned about that that they wanna create these separate products and it's actually doing more harm than good. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that us as an industry have to really take a stand, get on the soapbox and say, there is no reason to have this. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no reason to have this. And once we focus on that, once we focus on inclusion as just the de facto stance, and we say to people, listen, if you're not okay with that, you're not welcome here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting part of the Twitch platform. We're not a First Amendment platform. We're a club. Acceptance to our club is not being an asshole, okay? And there are different levels of being an asshole, but like hate speech and those kinds of things don't have a space on our platform for a reason, because no one who goes live on the internet should ever have to deal with that. It's an incredibly brave thing to do. Competing on a national or global stage in front of millions of other people is a brave thing that no one should have to feel verbal or physical retaliation for. Mm -hmm. And so I think if the industry focuses on that for now and people see that superstars of all genders 
can be successful, then I really believe that the overall industry will shift. It's going to take time. It's absolutely going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. But I do believe that gaming is that sport where we can really embrace this idea of inclusivity and an opportunity um, as long as we do it the right way. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'm going to leave. Can I add one thing to that, if I may? Sure. And that is that, and I'm seeing it, and I hope you all are too, in that in order to make it happen, you need to be intentional. Mm -hmm. You really need to think about it. And when you talk about what you're talking about, that's the intentionality that needs to be in the forefront of the conversation. And that'll get you to those places quicker. Sure. I'm sorry. We're, we're going to excuse guys. Nathan. He has a flight to catch. Uh, yeah. You can do a little, Thanks, guys. A little dance on the way out, as promised. Maybe? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so lots of good information there. Um, I'm like, oh, I agree with this. Oh, I agree with that. So <laughs> I'm trying to think what I want to hit on. Um, I do agree with, with Nathan's point in terms of we can't fall into the trap of separate but equal. With the caveat, though, that we do, we, it's OK to carve out some spaces, you know, um, for, for underrepresented populations. So if we, if we start out with like, okay, maybe this is a women's only class for now, right? Um, to make sure that women are comfortable uh, learning a particular game. Um, I volunteered for several years as a Python um, programming instructor for women only classes. And those classes were, they had an extremely different dynamic than, than co-ed classes. So I think we need to carve out the space for that. However, I, I absolutely agree that when it comes to something like competition and, and official events, they absolutely need to be co-ed. The separate and equal does, does not work. It doesn't exist, and we can't be falling into that trap. Um, a, per, a, a problem that I wanted to talk about, um, sort of a barrier, and, and this sort of echoes what Ben said, is that it's not really exclusive to esports. It's more of a social issue in terms of women getting into, into any industry. But I think um, looking at gender stereotypes, uh, those can be very hurtful. Um, one thing that I, uh, example I always think about, if you guys haven't seen the movie, it's called Code debugging the gender gap, and it's talking about gender disparity in the tech industry. And they talk about the, this one study that was done where the researchers gave two groups of people a math test, and the first group you know, just took the test as is, nothing special. The second group, before they took the test, the researchers gave them an instruction. They said, hey, I know you heard that you know, women are worse at math than men, they're just not that good, but this test isn't like that. We calibrated it, and you know, men and women score equally well on this math test. And so after that, that group took the test. So in the first group, women actually scored noticeably worse than men. And in the second group, they scored equally as men. So it's looking at stereotypes, it, it's really important to understand that they have a huge psychological impact. So if we talk about, like, oh, women are bad at video games, that might be you know, objectively true if we test every single woman um, that's currently playing video games, but that's after a life of being told that they're bad, right? If, if you tell somebody that they're stupid over and over again, eventually they're not gonna be a very bright or, or you know, thriving individual. And, and, and so that's what's happening with these gender stereotypes is that they're becoming self-fulfilling excuse me, prophecies. That we tell women that they're bad and then they are bad. So as we're talking about the, uh, the esports industry becoming more mature, I think one thing that we need to look at is, is patience, right? We can't say, well, women are performing worse right now, that's just because they're women. No, let's, let's give it time, let's give women the support that they need to really get up to speed uh, and, and be on the same level and, and really hold those stereotypes back so we're not harming the women in the industry. So, did, did you want yeah, so I, I just want to add to that, and it gets back to the comment I made earlier about intentionality and, and the like. Um, as entities mature, just think about it as children. You know, most of the people who are playing the games, their frontal lobe isn't even fully developed. I mean, that doesn't happen until we're 25, 26 years of age mm -hmm. as, as adults. So you can't have certain expectations um, of a 12 or a 15-year-old than you can have of a 25-year-old. So you have to really embed intentionally concepts around codes of conduct and appropriateness. And, there, and it can't just be words on a piece of paper. It's like, for example, the work that we're doing around 
uh, NASEF and the North America Scholastic Esports League is you have to actually train and learn and talk about and blog and discuss what is toxicity, what does it mean? How do I put myself in that person's shoes and how would I feel if someone said X, Y, or Z to me and dialogue it and discord it and understand the feelings and the sense of what it's about. So the concept of intentionality is not not just about behavior, it's about gender and gender acceptance, race and racial acceptance, mm-hmm. inclusion, uh, people who are all different, whatever it may be, and it has to be something that's front and center in a training, in a teaching, in a learning around the maturation of what the program is about. Sports teams like yours are doing that and you're having those conversations and that's the kind of thing that needs to be deeply embedded um, from an early stage on as kids become involved in this sport and this activity. I so strongly agree with all of that. It's, it's so much, to me, it's so simple. It's coaching and mentorship. It's, it's understanding that kids are gonna screw up but being there to correct it when it happens uh, and to set the right example and to, and to have the conversation and to drive the dialogue and to be unwilling to not say something. Uh, you know, an example, if I may, just for a minute, sure, sure. is um, there was a team that was, for lack of a better term, kind of hijacked by the team leader. Um, and he was very toxic to the team online, everything else. And when, in, through our system, we have an anonymous reporting system. So they can take it, take it up, not have any fear of repercussions. And when the investigation occurred, um, it became clear what was happening. So instead of being punitive, what happened was the staff of the organization went in and they discussed it, they talked about it. Why did this happen? Why did you let it happen? How did this person get to that position? What can you do to make sure that doesn't happen again? They had to write about it, they had to talk about it, they had to blog about it. They literally had to go on Discord and talk about what it was that we went through and how can other teams and other people learn from um, the toxicity and the challenges and the cyberbullying and the like that occurred with us. And these are the consequences. It's not punitive, it's about learning, as you talk about. And that's the way when you think about how do you raise a child or how do you mature as a society, those are the kinds of activities you really have to engage in. Absolutely, absolutely agree. And so you all started answering the next question a little bit, but with the follow-up to looking at some of the uh, the problems that women face entering the esports industry was looking at some of the solutions. So I know that you partially answered um, some of the steps that organizations can take. So if you want to follow up on that, go ahead. Or if you have even just sort of one point or one uh, piece of advice that you can give to everybody, so even if you're not an executive in a a company, if you're a gamer, if you are a streamer, if you're just out in the esports industry, what one piece of advice can you give um, to essentially create more inclusion and especially encourage women's participation? Don't be toxic. Don't be toxic. Don't be toxic. (laughs) Don't let it happen. Don't don't allow it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when you see it, squash it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I I bet you that if through some great effort of, of leaders and role models and mentors to educate and to diminish toxicity, I bet more women would come in. Mm-hmm. I bet one of the primary barriers to entry for girls is just this feeling of, shit, I don't wanna be here, this sucks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If we can make that go away, I think you're gonna be right at 50-50 in no time. So I'm gonna take it from a different angle. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I'm gonna take a few minutes, if I may, and talk about the responsibility of industry. Sure. And not the attendee, the participant, the player, et cetera. And that is that with the development of esports, there is a bush winning and development of an entire new set of opportunities in workforce and workforce development. And one of the things that industry is going to need in order for it to sustain itself is to have a pipeline of people who have the skill sets to be able to do what they've done today, tomorrow, and the next day, and the next year, et cetera, et cetera. Not just gaming, but the ability to create and to build systems and operations and the like. One of the things that I think that can be done, it's aligned with what you're talking about, is the idea of being able to articulate that and then serve as mentors and coaches in a workforce way. And I think part of what happens is disenfranchised youth, people who are underserved, women, in whatever categories where people don't feel that they're part of the 
the letterman, you know, who wears that sweater and jacket in high school that everyone goes and says, oh, you're so cool kind of stuff, is how do you reach them and how do you go ahead and intentionally think about what are the opportunities where I'm just a casual gamer, but I love this and I want to figure out how do I connect all of this together for some social good and also purpose in my own life. And I think that's part of what industry itself is wrestling with in how they do it. It's more than just, forgive my political sense here, it's more than just the exploitation of human capital for economic gain. Mm -hmm. It's really about social responsibility tied into that in a way that can do the kinds of things that you're talking about. And when that balance is struck, mm -hmm. you'll see a huge opportunity that exists societally around the world with this. Yeah, I agree. And uh, just to add on to it, I, 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 I truly think it's one dialogue, right? Like the way we're gonna be successful, you build a community, uh, you make it a safe place, uh, you put leaders in there who are gonna be good role models and who are gonna teach the right lessons, uh, and then you just watch it grow. Because guess what? We're all gamers, every one of us. We yeah. all wanna be a part of this. Agreed, agreed. So uh, my piece of advice is similar to Ben's, like don't be toxic, but it's just a little, a, little more, a little more narrowed down. So I think paying attention to the language that we use is really important because language is a very powerful tool that can be used for good or for evil. And for example, think about the phrase person with disabilities, right? That's something that changed recently, maybe in the past decade, because we used to call uh, people disabled person, right? And we changed that to person with disabilities, and that was such a powerful change. That was, that was using language for good, right? Where saying, okay, you're this different person when we're calling them disabled person. We went to, you're a person first, and maybe have some, you know, differences that we also can address on the back end if you, you know, uh, with accessibility issues and things like that. And, and that's really important. So to me, one piece of advice, uh, if you guys want to take something with you today and carry it out into the world is um, don't call women girls. It, it's a very, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's rude. You know, it's, it's infantilizing and it's um, essentially um, not, not respecting women as full-grown adults, not respecting women as, as adults with complete intelligence, right? Essentially teach, treating them as children. So that's really important. Um, you know, call women gals, women, ladies, whatever is appropriate for the situation, but don't call them girls unless you're actually talking about like a five-year-old child. So um, you were nodding. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we actually have a couple more questions. Uh, I'm sorry, ex excuse me, a couple more minutes. So we'll just take those two minutes to just, you know, say like your favorite thing or like the thing that most surprised you about esports. Just like, what's the happiest thing about esports? Uh, we have uh, the ability to really change the world uh, for, in a big way. Mm -hmm. I, uh, it bothers me when people say we're not saving lives because I think we are. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you can give somebody purpose, you can give somebody a, a chance, you can give somebody an education. Uh, and I've had the privilege of being in positions to see that change happen and to see people elevate themselves and take a next step because of doors open through gaming and esports. Mm -hmm. We have seen in at least my lifetime um, technology playing a huge role in the transformation of society and social norms and opportunities for people. Whether you go far back, way before my time, to like the light bulb and the telephone and the airplane and those kinds of things, but go to um, the concept of the iPhone, go to the concept of um, the social or the um, software programming. I mean, think about it. Companies like Google and Amazon and Apple 15 years ago didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. And the jobs that have been created and the opportunities and the impact that has occurred in the last 15 years, esports and what the role of esports and gaming can be is transformational society-wise, just like those kinds of interventions and opportunities and inventions have been. So I think that, like I said, there's so much there and there's so much potential it's just that how do you do it in a way where there's good balance and that you're really intentional about how you make it for good and not just for exploitation? That's great. Uh, for me, the happiest thing about esports is the limitless potential for friendship. 
and like we were talking about, you know, games are global, so I can be playing League of Legends too with somebody who's in a completely different country. And um, in, in my case, actually, what happened, I randomly matched with a guy who was a couple of states away, and we became friends over time. I actually just went to his wedding last year. So it, it, it's amazing that we can connect with people that we otherwise would never meet because they live so far away and make these unique friendships um, from across the globe. So, so thank you so much. If you guys have any questions for us, I don't know if there's a, uh, there's a mic, you're welcome to ask us. You're welcome to stick around afterwards. We'll try to stick around as well. But thank you so much for joining us. This was amazing. Thank you.